Hello and welcome back to my Michael Powell retrospective and today I'm talking about a Canterbury tale. Now imagine it's the 1940s, the middle of the war, and you go to your local cinema, you sit back in your seat and get comfy, and on comes a film about a man in a little Kent village in the countryside going round at night putting glue in women's hair. And then the whole movie is spent in the group of a plucky trio of young things, a land girl and her two soldier friends, one of whom's American, one of whom's British, trying to find out who the culprit is. It's like an episode of Scooby-Doo, or a sort of children's film foundation caper movie from the early 1970s. Yet somehow, it contrives to be one of the most moving and beautiful films ever to come out of Britain. How? At first sight, this seems to be a step back for Michael Powell, from the dizzy heights of Colonel Blimp. We've gone back to black and white. We've gone back to a more realist, less theatrical sort of style of filmmaking. And the actors are not quite as powerful as that wonderful trio that we had in Colonel Blimp. Sheila Sims and Dennis Price would go on to become major film, uh, film actors in Britain. But here, to be honest, they're a bit green. Okay, And the American soldier is played by James Sweet. This is an interesting story, actually. They, the producers wanted one of the American Hollywood stars who was currently serving in the army in the UK, but the US Army wouldn't allow it. So Powell went to some sort of amateur theatricals that the US Army were doing in London, and he found this guy. And actually, although apparently it took him loads of takes to get it right... He's got an easy, natural charm, and he's the most sympathetic character in the entire film. The villain, the local magistrate, the bad man, um, is played by Eric Portman, who is excellent as always. But it seems at first to be a step back from Powell's excellence, that the summit that he'd risen to in Colonel Blimp. But let's look at how this movie begins. Now, I spoke in the last video about Colonel Blimp, about the different strands in British propaganda. First of all, the strand about looking back across British history, finding out who the British are, what are we fighting for here? Secondly, the strand of appealing to women in the audience on the home front, and why these films need to reach out to them and explain to them their purpose in the war effort. And thirdly, a growing concern in Michael Powell and Pressburger's movies, the relationship between British and American servicemen who didn't really get on. There was a bit of prickliness. You know, here were these American GIs, you know, tall and good-looking with their great teeth, you know, who were really cool and easygoing with women. And the British soldiers didn't really like it very much. And the American soldiers found themselves in this cold, grey country, a bit fish-out-of-water-ish. And so you get these movies, these propaganda movies from Britain at the time that try to tell the Americans what they're fighting for and why they should like Britain and say the British why you should like the Americans. <laughs> It's quite amusing, really, and that's played with humorously throughout this film. But let's go back to this idea of British history. This is where this film starts. And it starts, it's called A Canterbury Tale, and it, it's inspired by the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer, and it starts with a beautifully read, the prologue of Canterbury Tales is read beautifully by Esmond Knight. And we see, you know, the characters of the Canterbury Tales you know, on horseback, riding through the English countryside. One of them has a falcon on his wrist, and he sends the falcon up into the air, and we see it flapping around in the skies. Cut. A sort of subliminal cut, you barely see it, and suddenly the bird is coming down, but it's a spitfire, a World War II plane. Years later, 20 years later, Kubrick got enormous compliments about that brilliant cut. You remember it where the ape, the ape man, is using a bone. The bone flies up into the air and it comes down millennia later as a nuclear bomb circling the earth. Michael Powell got there first. That idea of one cut concertinuing the whole of history, a jump across centuries, that was done first in a Canterbury tale. The thematics are slightly different, I agree, but the genius of it is still there, linking the world of Chaucerian England with the world of now. It's a brilliant cut, absolutely superb. So now we go into this modern story, this peculiar story, this kind of little sort of whodunit 
about a man putting glue in women's hair. And if you're, if you're very uh, observant, you'll notice a young Charles Hawtrey, pre-carry-on days as the station master. And the first part of the story is all filmed in chiaroscuro, in, in very in darkness, in the blackout at a train station. And Sheila Sims is introduced, you know, almost film noir way. She you know, kind of walks out of a lit doorway smoking a cigarette. Anyway. And so we go into this story of who the blue man is. And we know from a very early stage that it's the magistrate. And Powell, Powell's use of framing in this film is extraordinary. Check out the, the quick, very quick first introduction shot of the magistrate. He, what happens is his two sergeants come in the room. He's in this old courtroom, this old judgment room from the old days. They come in, they have to go up some steps, so the camera is travelling up the steps, and you just see Portman at his desk. And above the steps, right at the top, is a bar saying, only the truth, you shall honour the truth. It's a brilliant piece of framing, because right from the beginning, Portman's character is framed as someone who is trapped in truth. He's penned in by truth. And what we will see is that this is a man who is doing this awful thing to these girls in the village to try to get them to see the truth, to try to get them to stop going to dances and, you know, enjoying flirting with American soldiers and to think about the truth of this war and what they're fighting for. In a way, these shock tactics that Eric Portman's character is using is exactly what Powell and Pressburger are doing with this film using this peculiar narrative to try to shock us into thinking about what we're fighting for. What is this war? What does it mean? Right? Now, most of the film is rather bucolic. It's a very lazy, slow-paced film, just watching people talk to each other and working the land in this beautiful Kent village. But it's building, of course, to the journey to Canterbury. And... All the time, this Culpepper character is trying to tell people, this is what's important, where you're going towards, right? He has a lecture in the movie where he tries to make people see this, and he says, look, up there at the top of the village, there's, there is the road, the original pilgrimage road, a bend in the road. And if you go up there, you can hear the hoofbeats, you can hear the laughter of the peasants. And of course, that brilliant shot at the beginning, that's exactly what it's doing. It's showing you that that moment from the Falcon to the Spitfire, history is just there if we care to see it, if we care to feel it. Powell has shown this already in the filmmaking. It's an extraordinary callback, if you like. And the young woman changes from being suspicious of Culpepper to being admiring of him. And there's a wonderful scene where she goes up to this bend of the road in the hills and together her and Culpepper meet and they realise that they are of a similar mind. And there's also the, almost the budding of a romance and they hide in the grass as the two soldiers have a chat. It's an extremely moving and powerful scene. But eventually Culpepper realises that the three young people have, you know, they've found him out and that he is the villain. And the four of them travel on a train together to Canterbury. Now, the idea of the film is that they will eventually get to Canterbury and they'll be blessed. So the, the young English soldier has a dream of becoming an organist and by chance he'll end up playing the organ at Canterbury Cathedral. A very beautiful sequence, actually very moving. The girl goes back to Canterbury to look at the caravan in which he and her fiancé originally visited the village where Culpepper lives, and she's going back to exercise the demons of her past, only to find out that the fiancé who she thought had been killed in battle is actually still alive. A miracle, right? And the American soldier finally gets to meet his colleague in the, in the streets of Canterbury. So the film sort of has a nice little miracle for every character at the end. But that's sort of to undermine its power, really. What's really happening here is self-realisation. All of these people are coming to realise who they are and why they're fighting through looking into history. 
both their own past and that of the country of England, their own society, their own civilization, And that's their pilgrimage. That's the Canterbury tale. And it's very moving as the soldiers move towards, on that old path towards Canterbury Cathedral. It's incredibly moving. There's a few other things I'd like to say about this film before I go. It's such a rich film, but these are the things I'd like to focus on first. First of all, Powell's interest in children. Remember in One of Our Aircraft is Missing, the first time the English airmen land, and they're trying to find out where they are, they come across some children. Children repeat all the way through Michael Powell's films, and their sort of boisterous anarchic energy is kind of the energy of the movie themselves. And this, this film has a wonderful sequence where the American general co-opts the help of the local kids, and they're having this sort of mini battle on the river near the mill. It's a fantastic sequence. And it's also worth noting that if you watch this film right through to the end credits, it doesn't end with a vision of Canterbury Cathedral. It ends with some boys playing football on a pitch. That is the energy, the beautiful wartime energy of England that Powell is really interested in and invested in. He's also invested in women. Watching this film, this is a film from 1944, we might not see that it's actually quite racy. It's, it's very frank about the relationships between men and women. For example, Sheila Sim, the main character, has been living in a caravan with her fiancé, not her husband. Gosh, you know. And there's very free talk about the local girls associating with the soldiers. There's one brilliant conversation between two women where, you know, Sheila Sim is concentrating on the glue man. And the woman she's talking to, you know, she's interested in the local soldiers and going for a dance with them even though her boyfriend is away at war and she doesn't see anything wrong with that and she doesn't see any guilt in it. Throughout the film, it's very frank about women and men. And of course, there is a strain about this. The the main heroine and the hero Culpepper, the anti-hero, the anti-hero Culpepper is marked out as a misogynist right from the beginning. He has a ducking stool. You know, that was the thing that he was used to put witches, to test witches. They were ducked into mill ponds and if they... If they drowned, they were all right, but if they survived, they were witches, you know. And he has it, he has it st- st- you know, there as a decoration in his judgment hall. And he's putting glue in women's hair to deter them from going out with soldiers. And right at the end, Sheila Sim, in full, fr- in full close-up, says, why don't you just ask the girls what they thought? So it's a proto-feminist movie in a, in a weird, twisted way, and very frank about sexual relations and women's, what's going on with women during the war. The, third, the other aspect of propaganda that I spoke about in Colonel Blimp was this idea that propaganda films had to try and tell the British this is not a normal war. This is not a game of cricket. We've got to be like the Nazis in order to beat them. I just want to put it out there. Isn't that what Culpepper is doing? He's taking a really harsh, almost brutal, you know, queasily sadistic way of trying to get people, to force people to think about their past, to get them to understand what they're fighting for, and to fight more fully with more passion and more spirit. In a way, in a queasy kind of way, it it clicks into that idea that we've got to be like the Nazis to beat the Nazis. And that brings me, finally, to the, the final point I'd like to make about this film, and that's politics. Powell was a Tory, and this is a very Tory film, when you think about it. It's a film about the primacy of land, and the people of that land, and their race memory of their own history, and how it's part of who they are today. I'll just leave you with a question. How do we feel about that now, in a time of globalisation? When our politics and our economy pushes us away from ideas of the nation state, away from the idea of being a collective people with a collective history on a piece of land that is part of us, towards being a more diverse, mixed group of people for whom ideals and political constitutions are more what binds them together. How do we react to Powell's film now, all these years hence? Thanks very much.